for you this morning to Acts chapter 19, and we're going to read verses 1 to 12. A very interesting passage of scripture, and one that has caused numerous books to be written, and numerous acres of pages taken up in debate and interpretation. But I've entitled our study this morning, Incomplete Faith. Incomplete faith. So let's see what God has to say to us this morning as we open his word. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. And there were about twelve men in all. And Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and evil spirits left them. Amen. And praise God for his word. What a fantastic passage of scripture to come to this morning. And it's interesting that in the NIV, in their little subheadings, they have just one little phrase. Paul in Ephesus. And yet so much is in this passage of scripture. Acts of the early church reveal the importance of having a complete faith to be a believer who truly believes and truly trusts and truly knows the fundamental truth of the gospel. They know what they believe so they can truly serve Christ in this world and further his kingdom. That was the priority of the early church to ensure that the believers were well discipled and well grounded in their faith. Proclamation and teaching was central to the growth of the believer. In fact, in AD 150, and there's actually a picture of it on the screen, <coughs> excuse me, it's a picture of one of the first discipleship books. It was called the Didache. And it appeared as a type of manual for discipleship for new believers so that they could be established in the faith. Listen to some of the topics it covers. <coughs> Advice for living the Christian faith. Relating to church leaders. Understanding baptism and communion. Understanding prayer. Discerning the word of God and how to spot a counterfeit word. Oh, do we need that in our generation? Importance of a church. Being part of it. Knowing the Christian hope fully. Relating to government. And so it goes on. It was a discipleship book to enable believers to know what they believe, to spot the errors, and to live for Christ and Christ alone. And in our generation, understanding the Word of God is absolutely imperative as we're challenged more and more about what we believe and what the Bible says. Therefore, discipleship of new believers is absolutely essential. And it's certainly something I've sought to do throughout the whole of my ministry to stress the importance of discipleship. You know, even in this past week, Street preachers were convicted of public order defences for quoting the King James Bible. You know, that Bible is just on the screen there. 
suddenly become totally offensive afresh. They give account of what they believed and they answered questions at the request of the heckling crowd. They were probably more offensive than the preachers who were actually sharing the word of God. Free speech did not prevail. Some people took offence, called the police, and the police came in and arrested the street preachers. At the trial, the prosecutor effectively declared the Bible is an old book and persona non grata, not acceptable in a modern generation. In other words, it causes offence and should only be heard behind closed doors and certainly not on public streets. That's the kind of gist of where the trial went. It's almost like going back to the days of Acts, Acts of the early church. And I wonder how many of us fully understand our Christian faith. What do we know about the triune God? What do we know about grace? What do we know about justification? What do we know about assurance, the Holy Spirit in the believer's life? What do we know about the church? What do we know about the return of Christ, the world and our responsibilities? What do we know about all these things? In this generation, we need to make it our priority to know more of the things of God so we can stand and still be standing when Christ calls us home or comes again. And certainly, systematic preaching and teaching each week of the Word of God is absolutely imperative. A number of churches in our generation have chosen not to have sermons anymore. They come along and they have a good time together, whether it's preaching, whether it's uh, some kind of format of worship, very relaxed, but on systematic preaching and teaching. That's a slippery slope. And the moment we go down that slope, then we are not preparing ourselves for the battle to which God calls us to. And the reality is, incomplete faith was seen in these folks who had an element of belief and an element of faith but they did not fully understand what they believed. And Paul, the apostle to the Gentile, arrives in Ephesus to teach the believers and to build them up in their faith and also to wrestle with those who as yet did not believe. And so he had a two-pronged offensive, as it were, to build up and to lead to faith, to disciple and also to share and to make sure the word of God went forth. And hence we have the account in Acts of believers knowing what they believe. And also in this particular passage of scripture, being able to discern those who had an incomplete faith. And Paul challenges these believers to know what they believe. He challenges them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believe? Verse 2. And then of course it follows on. What baptism did you receive? Incomplete believers here. They had a partial understanding of belief, a limited understanding of truth. And these folks have come from John's camp, John the Baptist's camp, rather than the fullness of Christ's camp. <coughs> Matthew 3 reminds us that John the Baptist preached a very different uh, message, as we've seen in past sermons when we did John's Gospel. And John's preaching was one of preparing the way for the Lord Jesus Christ, whom he was even unworthy to untie his sandal laces. John 3 and verse 11 reminds us of that. And John had no illusions, continuing in John 3 and 12 with a picture of separation, burning and judgment, and unquestionable fire. He didn't mince his words. The preaching of John was hell, fire, and judgment, as one writer said. A strange man with a holy boldness. 
And when the Pharisees saw John baptizing crowds of people, they took offense against John. But likewise, John took spiritual offense towards them and reserved some of the harshest words ever written in Scripture. You snakes, you vipers brood, who warned you to flee of the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And these leaders of the law were like the group that Paul encountered at Ephesus. They were religious. They had an element of understanding, but they had an incomplete faith. And verse 10 reminds us that John's picture of the cutting of the roots of the tree in Matthew's gospel that does not bear fruit. And the burning of that waste reminds us of the reality of the, the awesome, awesome price that many will pay when they do not know Jesus Christ as Saviour and Lord. A lost eternity, judgment and hell, which is not an acceptable way of preaching in this generation. If I said it outside, I would be arrested. But John's preaching was necessary to prepare the way. Necessary because of two stages in our walk with God. First through the Spirit of God who moves and convicts us of sin. Convicts us of our need to repent and to believe. And when the light suddenly dawns on us, we're awakened to our inadequacies. We know we cannot save ourselves with religious talk, religious work or religious piety. As Habakkuk declares in chapter 3 and verse 4, the righteous person will live by faith alone. We come to faith by the power of God working within us. And by the blood of the Lamb, we took our sins upon himself on that tree at Calvary. Christ paid the price. And when the revelation comes by the precious Holy Spirit, we're just like the believers on the day of Pentecost. And Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 reminds us of this. Repent, be baptized every one of you for the, your sins in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Conviction by the Spirit, repentance by the Spirit, and baptized or filled by the Spirit. Now I don't personally hold to second blessing theology. I don't want it to be limited to two experiences. I believe as true believers, when we truly repent and believe in Jesus Christ, God comes and dwells within us as we give our life over to him. The Holy Spirit comes and seals us and comes and enables us to walk with God. We're sealed or immersed in the Holy Spirit. And certainly that was my experience as a believer. When I first came to Christ, the dramatic change in my heart and outlook on life was absolutely incredible. And that could only be through and by a work of God. And likewise in the young believers who were around me at that time. And of course... There are subsequent experiences of the Spirit. There are subsequent gifts of the Spirit. We've seen that in some of our studies. There are the gift of tongues and so on. But everything decently and in order and in accordance with the work of God and with the ways in which God desires to work and move in our life. No one can truly be a believer. No one can say, I am a Christian, unless they receive the Spirit of God by truly surrendering their life to Christ. And it's as we do so, we receive the Spirit of God sealing us. There's no such thing as a non-Spirit-filled Christian. We can, of course, have our hearts warmed by the Spirit of conversion and the Spirit of God can reside in us. And sometimes, sadly, we can quench the Spirit or stem the Spirit's work within us. And we can become stagnant. A phrase you've heard me use time and time again. Guard and keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And our relationship with Jesus and our devotional walk with Him determines our walk in the Spirit. I have in my many years as a believer met all manner of Christians from every denominational background. 
deeply, deeply devoted in their walk with Christ, folk from card-carrying, extreme, ultra-charismatic groups, to, on the other end of the scale, extreme, 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 devout coverness. And some of the meetings that I've been at have been quite incredible. You can sense the Spirit of God within these meetings. Some of the meetings were folks giving words in tongues and their interpretation. And then other meetings where it was so profound, the Spirit of God, there was an attitude of silence. And it was as though we were walking on holy ground. You sense the presence of God. And the common denominator was the fact here were groups of people devoted to Jesus, devoted to his word, walking in his word, living the word, and had a willingness to wait and receive his revelation and to declare it in the power of the Holy Spirit who lives in the lives of the believers. You know, our fallen nature, our inclination to sin, our world conditioning, all pressure us into the realms of temptation. The temptation to think that we are master of our own destiny, of our own life. Self-sufficiency is a scourge of the church in this our generation. I can do everything. I can do it all. Nonsense. Metanoia. Perish the thought. Away with the thought. Throw it out into the rubbish heap. Slight paraphrase to the meaning. Remember the song that Stuart Townsend wrote, In Christ Alone? The words are absolutely profound. Till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied, for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me from life's first cry to final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. I wonder if we truly believe that this morning. And it is as the Spirit of God moves within our lives, Jesus does command our destiny when we quench or stem the Spirit's work we begin to grow stagnant. As believers are empowered in the Spirit, we extend the kingdom of God as God leads us. And sometimes I've heard the song sung, more power, more power, Lord, more power in our lives. But it's not a reality. If the Spirit of God is living within us, we have that power. And we have that power living within us, moving within us. And the question is, what are we doing with God's power? Are we open to God's leading and God's prompting? Or are we questioning what God is actually wanting us to do? Perhaps we should be singing and praying more openness, more willingness, Lord, in my life. Rather than more power. Because in this our generation, we have become obsessed with power. And it always comes back to one thing. I want the power to make me look good. I want the power to do my will. Rather than seeking God's power to be released in our life. And for the will and the mind of Christ to be made manifest. And Jesus is the only way to the Father. The only way to live as a believer. Any other way is counterfeit, it's a distortion, it's a lie. We find that in this passage of scripture, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance with a view to a coming deliverer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the contrast, of course, is Christian baptism. The view of a present saviour, one who saves and enables us in the Spirit's power to die to our old life and to rise to new life with a new power to live a new life for Jesus. That's what baptism's all about. You've heard me say that many, many times when we've had baptisms in the church here. 
And you've heard me say that water baptism does not regenerate us. That's a counterfeit message. The Spirit of God regenerates us by faith in Jesus alone. And then, as an act of obedience to that, we're baptized. And we die to self. And we come up, rising up out of the water, declaring to the world, I now have a new life. A life I will live for Jesus. And live in obedience to him. Acts 19 and verse 5 reminds us, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hearing, believing, and obeying. And then in verse 6, Paul prays that the Spirit of God came upon them and they spoke in tongues and they prophesied. And of course, Pentecostalists and Charismatics would declare this as a, a proof text for a two-stage Christian initiation or second blessing theology. Faith and conversion first, then Holy Spirit reception. But these folks were not true believers in Christ. Because they had an incomplete faith. Michael Green quotes John Stoddard in this passage, declaring, It is crystal clear that these disciples were in no sense Christians, having not yet believed in Jesus, whereas, through the ministry of Paul, they came to believe, were baptized with water and spirit simultaneously. In our passage, we have folks who know nothing of Pentecost, and God, by his grace and favor, grants them their own mini Pentecost. I like that. I like that kind of phrase. They didn't miss out. God ministered to them. And they were just like the believers at Pentecost, empowered and strengthened for the days and the works of faith in the period ahead. As John Scott writes, the norm of the Christian experience is a cluster of four things. Repentance, faith in Jesus, water baptism, and the gift of the Spirit. And through the perceived order, I'm sorry, though the perceived order may vary a little, the four belong together and are universal in Christian initiation. Well, it happened for these folks. They came and had their faith made complete. And this group was incorporated into the church by faith alone in Christ Jesus. There was no other way to be part of the bride of Christ. And of course, they went on to work with Paul, as is implied within our passage. And Paul came to the synagogue and the lecture hall, as we see in verse 9. And uh, this is an amazing picture. I just want us to do a little side step just now. This picture here is a remaining part of the facade of the Hall of Trance. <clears throat> now I've never ever seen this picture before until I was preparing for today's sermon. I was absolutely astounded at the size of the place. I was astounded at the fact that this was a library with phenomenal pieces of learning. And Paul, when in the synagogue they refused to understand him or accept him, he moves to the Hall of Tyrannus. A seat of learning. And he stays there for two years. There were folks who must have been open to hearing. And some of the most intellectual folks of the day were part of that group because that's where they gather. And Paul speaks boldly and argues persuasively about the kingdom of God. That is, V translation has arguing and pleading. Interesting word, that pleading. I wonder when. Did you last sense the Spirit of God implore you to plead on behalf of others before the Lord's throne of grace? I wonder when last did you weep for the lost and weep for those around you, knowing what the end is in life for them? 
for those who do not believe? When do we last become so overwhelmed at the reality that strangers and friends and family are going to a lost eternity, that under the Spirit's power you plead and you weep for the lost with every fibre of your being? That's implied in Paul's ministry. Pleading, pleading that they would repent, pleading that they would turn, pleading before God for them. In verse 9 of our passage, those who were hearing these words they became obstinate. They refused to believe. They maligned away. Doesn't that sound a bit like our generation? People don't like to hear things they don't want to hear because if it affects their lifestyle or affects their pocket or affects anything, then they're not having it. And they will bite back and bite back harshly. Christianity for Paul and the believers then was the way. The way of all ways in which to walk. And you know, it can be so frustrating by witnessing over a a long period of time when folks become suddenly obstinate and harsh and bite back. But it should not stop us sharing and speaking out. Because they need to hear to make an informed decision. And God respects their informed decision. Even if it is, I don't want anything to do with this Jesus. But they have heard. And we have been faithful in sharing that. The rest is between the individual and the Saviour. When this happened to Paul, well, did he pick up his ball and run home, refusing to play anymore? No. He went to the hall of Tyrannus. He changed his tack slightly, heads off to the lecture hall, takes over the lecture hall in the times, as some of the writers have said, in the periods where Tyrannus wasn't actually doing his things and the learned folks of the day. And Paul had free reign for two years. And under the guidance of the Spirit of God, he speaks boldly. He takes the other disciples with him. And has an amazing stickability to debate with the great and the good. And that can only come about (coughs) through his sustenance. And the grace of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know, not one of us here this morning has the strength or the gifting to do the works of God, save but by the Spirit of God. Verse 10, two years is the period. The way was the proclaimed phrase that was used. The way, the only way, the true way. And Paul never varied from that. And the Lord permits everyone to choose whether to believe or not. And as Paul proclaimed the gospel, praise God, men did. They began to choose whom they would serve. They chose to leave behind the gods of this world in favour of the one true God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that in this past week with the um, the street preachers being arrested, this is really the crux of the argument at the end of the day. Declaration that Jesus is the only way to the Father. And it will be interesting to see in the days ahead how the prosecutors are going to handle this one and how the defence are going to master their arguments as well. And we need to pray for all concerned at this time. Because it is, it is of paramount importance that God is honoured in the midst of that courtroom. Then you come to verses 11 and 12, and in the last two verses of our passage, we find the miraculous made manifest. The sweat band and the apron, that's really what, um, what the original text has uh, when they talk about the, the pieces of cloth that are being passed out and even when the handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched them 
were seen to the sick, their illnesses were cured. Basically, it was the workers' sweat band and the workers' apron. Manual workers in, which by general standards were tended to be pretty manly. The work we of the manual worker. And the significance of the passage is that it does not say that Paul did these extraordinary deeds, but God himself did these extraordinary deeds. Healing and restoration came about not through pieces of cloth, but through the power of God. And we need to understand that. As Barclay wrote, God is everywhere looking for hands to use. We may not be able to work miracles with our hands, but without doubt we can give our hands to God so that he can work miracles through them. It is God and God alone. Works of God and works of our true God, not man. And should God in his infinite mercy and grace choose to use us to pray and minister, Lord forbid, if we think for one minute we can do the miraculous. We're on a height to nothing. If we trust in our God, who can make heaven and earth, then his will will be done here on earth as it would be done in heaven. And the miraculous will be manifest in our midst, in this, our generation. It was in the 1990s when some American TV evangelists took these verses for their own. And they began to pray over large reels of ribbons and piles of hankies and proceeded to make extraordinary claims and promises. If you have this, you will be healed. And it was effectively a purchase under the disguise of making a donation to their ministry. And you know, during that time, huge numbers of people were left devastated and disillusioned, having sought to buy in to this kind of counterfeit theology. Wherever the money went, it's still to this day unknown. But wherever God is not honoured, and man seeks to take over for his own end and use his own ways, then these things fall apart. But when he leads us and we see his prompting in the leading of the Spirit, then great things can come about in the power of God. There are many charlatans around and have been from the beginning of time. And that's why going back to that first passage and slide that we had on the, on the, the screen, the importance of knowing and discerning what is right and what is wrong. Knowing the discernment, having the discernment to know the counterfeit and to know the truth. Because it's as we know that we can counterfeit, we can see the counterfeit and the charlatan. And we can seek in the power of God to stand up for the truth that sets people free and also brings wholeness and healing. God is glorified in the miraculous made manifest as we see in our passage. And we need to be mindful of the reality that God is God. He is almighty God. Not all needy God. Well, our time's gone. But I'm going to leave the words to the last to Graves Scrubby, a famous preacher of old. And he has three words to conclude his thoughts on this passage of Scripture. And I just love them. Three words, and even if, if you don't grasp anything else from the sermon this morning, take these three words away with you. Advance with Christ.
Christ. Let's pray. Father God, so many things we could have taken from this passage this morning. We ask that you continue to teach us and reveal to us your truth. Help us to walk in the truth, to live in the truth, and to be spurred on to greater and higher deeds through the truth of your word revealed to us in the power of your spirit where we live in this world. Lord, in your mercy, help us to take our focus and our eyes of our own ideas, our own skills, our own abilities, and to gaze upon the Lord Jesus Christ and to rely on the power of your precious spirit to do the works of the kingdom. Father, this morning, help us, strengthen us, empower us, and be glorified in our lives so that we can truly advance with Christ. Amen.